Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Sigma 35mm f1.4 DG DN Art, a wide angle prime lens designed for full frame mirrorless cameras and, at the time of testing, available in Sony E and Leica L mount versions. Here's hoping for Canon RF and Nikon Z versions of Sigma's mirrorless lenses soon. Surely, if we all ask for them at the same time, they have to do it right? Announced in April 2021 and costing $899 or £799, it's the successor to the 35 1.4 DG HSM, a DSLR lens that launched Sigma's art series back in September 2012, so that's around eight and a half years previously. Now, optical design, not to mention camera mounts, have come a long way in that time, and in 2021, Sigma now offers three different 35s in a native mirrorless mount, with the latest 1.4 model in the middle, here flanked by the compact f2 on the left, and the mighty f1.2 on the right. Which is your favourite? Sigma loaned me a 35 1.4 to test for this review, and while they described it as a pre-production sample, the quality and performance was near to final, and the box it came in certainly looked pretty final. As a pre-production sample though, the final models may vary. Sigma has high aspirations for the 35 1.4 art, so in this review I'll directly compare it against Sony's 35 1.4 G Master here on its right. Costing $1,399, the Sony is a considerable 500 bucks more expensive, but it's widely regarded as one of the best 35s ever made, so no pressure there then. Since I'm a thorough kind of guy though, I'll also include comparisons against the Sigma 1.2 on the far right, which at $1,499 is the most expensive of this group, and the Sigma F2 model on the far left, which at $639, is the cheapest. Testing four lenses side by side for macro, bokeh, portraits and landscapes, not to mention video, focus and breathing is no small task, so if you find any of this at all useful, please do subscribe if you haven't already. It really is the best way to support my work and keep my reviews coming. Thanks. Measuring 76 by 110 mil and weighing 645 grams, Sigma's mirrorless 35 1.4 is actually 16 mil longer and 20 grams heavier than the previous DSLR version. That said, if you're comparing the DSLR version which comes with the built-in E-mount adapter, the new lens becomes 10 mil shorter and 110 grams lighter. Meanwhile, Sony's 35 1.4 G Master, seen here on the right, is actually 14 mil shorter than the new Sigma and 120 grams lighter. Once mounted on a body though, they're in a similar ballpark and you won't notice much difference in a bag. The undisputed heavyweight here is the Sigma 35 1.2 on the far right, longer and wider at 88 by 136 mil and around 50% heavier at 1090 grams, the only one here to top the one kilogram weight. You really know when you're carrying that one. And finally on the far left, the Sigma 35 f2 is smaller at 70 by 65 mil and roughly half the weight of the two 1.4s at 325 grams. Oh, and in case you wondered, Sony's 35 1.8G measures 66 by 73 mil and is lighter than all four here at just 280 grams. To put them into perspective, here's all four lenses mounted on a Sony Alpha 1 body from smallest to largest, starting with the Sigma 35 f2, followed by the Sony 35 1.4GM, then the Sigma 35 1.4, and finally the Sigma 35 1.2. And now all four with their supplied hoods, starting with the Sigma 35 f2, then the Sony 35 1.4, both of which have cylindrical lens hoods, before moving to the petal-shaped hoods of the Sigma 35 1.4 and the Sigma 35 1.2. Note the Sony lens with its hood is almost the same length as the new Sigma without one. In terms of controls, the Sigma 35 1.4 has a clicky aperture ring running between f1.4 and f16, with a switch to one side locking it in the A position if you prefer body-based control. A switch below the barrel to the other side declicks the aperture ring for smooth and silent operation preferred by videographers. The manual focusing ring is wider than the Sony 35 1.4, and while both turned very smoothly, the Sigma on my sample felt a little stiffer and required a longer turn to travel through its focusing range. You might like that, but I personally found the Sony easier to manually focus. There's also a focus hold button that's customizable on compatible bodies. Sigma describes the design as dust and splash proof, including a rubber grommet on the mount. Now you'd expect weather sealing on a high-end lens, but remember the original DSLR version of this Sigma lens was not sealed, so this is an important upgrade. Meanwhile, the 35 1.4 employs a 67mm filter thread, the same as the Sony 35 1.4 G Master, although unsurprisingly the Sigma 1.2 demands larger 77mm filters, while the compact Sigma F2 and the Sony 1.8 G use 58 
and 55mm filters respectively. Ok now onto focusing and you're looking at the Sigma 35 1.4 DGDN on an Alpha 1 body set to single AFS mode where you can see the speed is fairly swift although like most Sigma lenses I've tested there's a visible contrast based hunt at each end to confirm. Set the body to continuous AFC mode though and the focusing becomes much faster. For comparison here's the Sony 35 1.4 also in AFS mode on the Alpha 1 where it's visibly snappier than the Sigma although again when set to AFC both lenses focused at a similar speed. That said Sony does not always support its fastest burst speeds with third party lenses when using continuous autofocus. On the Alpha 1 body the 35 1.4 G Master was able to shoot at up to 30 frames per second in my tests using the electronic shutter with AFC whereas the Sigma 35 1.4 slowed to between 12 and 14 frames per second again in my tests giving me roughly half as many frames to play with. Now that's still a lot of pictures but if you're buying a Sony body for the fast burst speeds do check for lens restrictions. And for completeness here's the AFS focusing test with the Sigma 35 1.2 and finally for the Sigma 35 f2. I'll show you some AFC tests later on. Let's move on to optical quality now starting with a portrait taken with the Sigma 35 1.4 at f1.4 on the Alpha 1 using eye detection. Taking a closer look reveals sharp details around my eyes as well as uh, attractive smooth rendering in the background. Certainly an improvement over the old DSLR version of the lens which often suffered from busy bokeh. Now viewed in isolation I think you'd be pretty happy with this result but I have three more lenses to show you. Starting with the cheaper Sigma 35 f2 on the right at f2 where you can see it's a little less crisp on the focused areas of my eyes while the areas in the background are obviously less blurred and more distinct thanks to the slower f2 aperture. So the pricier Sigma 35 1.4 unsurprisingly wins this particular pairing. But now let's switch to the Sony 35 1.4 G Master on the right at f1.4 where it's clear the Sony is delivering much crisper details with higher contrast too. It almost looks like the Sigma on the left is a little out of focus but I reshot this multiple times and chose the best examples for each lens and as you'll see in a moment this performance is reflected in my other tests too. In terms of background rendering they have slightly different styles but look equally good to me but in terms of focus detail and contrast the Sony is simply better when both are open to f1.4 and it also delivered a higher hit rate on focusing than the Sigma but then it's also $500 more expensive. And finally for the Sigma 35 1.2 on the right at f1.2 delivering a more magnified view thanks to its slightly longer actual focal length. But try to look beyond the size difference and again it's easy to see how this more expensive lens is crisper on the details. Similar in fact to the Sony although lacking its ultimate contrast here. Meanwhile the slightly greater magnification and slightly faster aperture are delivering slightly bigger bokeh blobs that are arguably the smoothest of the four lenses here. So a strong result for the Sigma 1.2 although it's by far the biggest of the four lenses and the most expensive too. A whole $600 more than the Sigma 35 1.4 and 100 bucks more than the Sony. Plus the high price didn't improve the AF consistency over the Sigma 1.4 with the Sony lens delivering the best hit rate at least in my tests on the Alpha 1 body. Now for bokeh blobs so I'll run through the entire aperture range of the Sigma 35 1.4 from f1.4 to f16 taken from close to its minimum focusing distance of 30 centimeters. Here you can see the new lens puts to rest the bokeh demons of its predecessor now delivering attractive and well behaved bokeh blobs with minimal outlining and barely no textures within. Sure there's inevitable rugby ball shapes in the corners at the maximum aperture but close it even by one stop and they mostly become circular while the 11 bladed diaphragm maintains a nice mostly rounded shape at f2.8 and f4. The geometric shape becomes more obvious at smaller apertures but overall I'm very happy with these results. Ok now for a comparison at the maximum apertures of each lens all shot from the same distance starting with the more affordable Sigma 35 f2 on the right where there's a dramatic difference in the size of the bokeh blobs. Looking closely the blobs on the f2 version on the right are also a little more textured than the f1.4 blobs on the left. I should say the Sigma 35 f2 is actually quite good in its class but it's up against some of the best here. Next up the Sony 35 1.4 G Master again at f1.4 where it's delivering similarly sized blobs to the Sigma 35 1.4 which are also mostly bereft of textures within. Note any dots on the Sony blobs though are due to some dust on my lens sorry about that. 
The Sony blobs also have less outlining, which may have you preferring one style over the other, but both lenses here are rendering very attractive blurred areas, so a good result for the Sigma given its cheaper price. Although do note the Sony can focus a bit closer, allowing it to deliver bigger blobs if that's what you prefer. And finally, the Sigma 35 1.2 on the right at f1.2, delivering the largest bokeh blobs of them all from the same distance, again thanks to its slightly longer actual focal length, coupled with the slightly faster f1.2 aperture. Both lenses show a little outlining, which you may or may not like, and arguably the 1.2 blobs have slightly more visible textures within, but I'd be delighted with either of them, so again a good result for the new 35 1.4 given its lower price. At the small end of the aperture scale, here's a quick look at diffraction spikes on the Sigma 35 1.4 at its minimum aperture of f16. Now UK skies can be quite hazy, so this isn't going to be as crisp as other climates, but it bodes well for sun stars and night cityscapes alike. One last close-up test with each lens focused as close as it would allow when set to manual and with the apertures wide open. Here's the Sigma 35 1.4 from about 30cm away, where it's reproducing 162mm across the frame. It's fairly sharp in the middle, but becomes quite soft at the edges, where I needed to stop it down to f4 to f5.6 for a good result at the extremes. For comparison, I put the Sigma 35 1.4 at the top, and start with the Sigma 35 f2 at the bottom, where the cheaper lens is reproducing 170mm across the frame, so that's fractionally lower magnification than the 35 1.4. Although the more interesting aspect is how the 35 f2 is a little sharper at the far edges, but dips a little in sharpness around the APS-C edges. Now I've seen this before on some lenses and it's always worth checking sharpness around this midpoint as well as in the middle and the extremes. Now for the Sony 35 1.4 G Master at the bottom where it's reproducing 134mm across the frame delivering the greatest magnification in this foursome although you will need to manually focus from this distance. More importantly though it's crisper in the middle and while it softens towards the edges it's still ahead of the Sigma 1.4. And finally, the Sigma 35 1.2 at the bottom, reproducing 165mm across the frame, making all three Sigma lenses actually quite similar in this regard. The Sigma 1.2 is, however, sharper than the 1.4 in the middle, and maintains this closer to the edges too, and remember this was shot at f1.2 as well. All four lenses can improve their edge sharpness when closed, but the two most expensive models are already excellent right out of the gate. And now for my distant landscape scene taken with the Alpha 1 and angled as always so that details run right into the corners where the lenses struggle the most. I use the default lens correction settings which on the Alpha 1 has distortion set to off. I'm starting with the Sigma 35 1.4 at f1.4 where I had to manually focus for the best result. Taking a close look in the middle shows a fair amount of detail, although at f1.4 it's lacking the ultimate crispness and contrast of higher end lenses like the Sony GM or indeed Sigma Zone f1.2. Stop this lens down even a little bit though and you'll gain sharpness and contrast with the lens peaking at around f4 to f5.6. Now let's return to the wide open f1.4 image and moving into the corner shows some darkening due to vignetting and again some softness when the aperture is wide open. As you close the aperture this improves quickly and again the best result is at around f4 to f5.6 here. Now for a comparison in the middle with the Sigma 35 1.4 on the left and the Sigma 35 f2 on the right, both at their maximum apertures and zoomed in for a closer look where they're both looking quite similar. Moving into the far corner also shows a similar result when they're at their maximum apertures and coincidentally both lenses capture almost exactly the same field of view. Remember just because the model quotes the same focal length doesn't mean the coverage will be identical in practice. Next on the right is the Sony 35 1.4 G Master with both lenses at f1.4 and you can clearly see how the Sony is delivering crisper details and higher contrast, avoiding the mild softening effect to the Sigma when shooting at their maximum apertures. Plus I could achieve this result using autofocus on the Sony. The Sony lens maintains this lead across the frame, although once you're looking in the far corners, some of the benefit is lost or slightly hidden due to darkening from vignetting. Note that the Sony 35 1.4 captures a slightly smaller field of view than the Sigma 35 1.4, perhaps due to some geometric correction taking place behind the scenes. Note that the Sigma lens exhibited some barrel distortion at distant focus or pin cushion close up, both of which can be reduced with distortion compensation on the camera set to auto. And finally on the right is the Sigma 35 1.2 at f1.2 and like the 1.4 model on the left, manually focus for the best result. I found both lenses sometimes slightly missed the optimal focus on the Alpha 1 when set to autofocus wide open and that was whether the body was in AFS or AFC mode so do be careful. 
Looking closely in the middle shows the 1.2 lens on the right delivering crisper details and higher contrast, just like the Sony in the previous comparison. In some previous tests I've found the Sigma 1.2 occasionally lacking, but it may have been down to less than optimal focusing. If you get it spot on, this lens can really deliver the goods, but you may need to switch from auto to manual focus in order to achieve it. Moving into the corner shows the Sigma 1.2 suffering from vignetting, but look through it and you'll see it impressively maintaining sharpness across the frame, and remember this is with the aperture wide open to 1.2. Note the Sigma 35 1.2 is delivering a slightly narrower field of view than the other four lenses, and is probably closer to around 38mm in focal length. Either way, I'm glad I'm able to now show this lens at its sharpest here, but again, it struggled to perform consistently in my tests with the Alpha 1 in autofocus. Before wrapping up my review, a few notes for the videographers out there, starting with some footage filmed with the Sigma 35 1.4 on the Alpha 1. Just like for stills, 35 is an ideal general purpose length for filming, wide enough to squeeze in bigger scenes, but not so wide to suffer from distortion. Movie autofocus, seen here on the Alpha 1 set to AFC, is smooth, quiet and hassle-free, with none of the hunting of AFS in stills, nor any issues with accuracy or repeatability. That said, it's not an issue for the other three lenses either, here with the Sigma 35 f2, and now for the Sony 35 1.4, and finally the Sigma 35 1.2, all set to their maximum apertures. You are more looking at the differences in rendering here. Focus breathing is however an issue for the Sigma 35 1.4 which as seen here visibly reduces the field of view as you focus from infinity to the closest distance of around 30cm. It almost appears as if the lens is zooming in and this can be distracting when pulling focus for video. You may also notice some barrel distortion at infinity gradually becoming pin cushion at the closest distance, although enabling distortion compensation in the Alpha 1 menus again can correct for this for stills and for video. It's not alone in focus breathing issues though, here's the Sigma 35 f2, again manually pulling focus from infinity to the closest distance, and again the image becomes visibly tighter. It's not quite as bad as the 1.4, but not far off either. And now for the Sony 35 1.4 G Master, which despite acing almost every test, is actually the worst behaved in terms of focus breathing. Here the reduction in the field of view is greater than the Sigma 35 1.4, although not by a huge margin. The winner of this particular foursome in terms of focus breathing is the Sigma 35 1.2, which may show a mild reduction in the field of view and require quite a turn of the focusing ring to get from far to near and back again, but it is the mildest offender in terms of focus breathing here. Ok, now time for my final verdict, and as I wrap up my review I'll show you a selection of images I took with the Sigma 35 1.4 DGDN on the Alpha 1. As always you can take a longer and closer look at them in my review of the lens at cameralabs.com. The Sigma 35 1.4 DGDN is a quality wide angle lens for mirrorless cameras that's capable of attractive rendering and sharp results. In my test with a pre production sample, the bokeh in blurred areas was not only a step up from the original DSLR version, but up there with models costing a lot more. Meanwhile, the focus details are ok at f1.4 but become much crisper if you can close the aperture even just one stop to f2. In terms of Sigma's own native mirrorless lenses, it slots comfortably between the f2 and 1.2 models in terms of price, size and overall quality, so a step up from the cheaper and more compact model, but a respectful step back from the flagship 1.2. I think it's interesting how the 35 1.2 and 35 1.4 represent two different levels of price, design and performance within the art series, and I wonder if we'll see two art options in other popular focal lenses going forward. I'm particularly interested to see what Sigma has planned for a 50mm in the native format, especially now Sony has raised the bar with its recent 51.2G Master. If you're an L mount owner looking for a relatively affordable 35, Sigma has you covered with its three native 35s all priced comfortably below Leica's own Summerlux 1.4. In fact, that lens costs double even the most expensive Sigma 1.2. Sony owners, however, have a lot more choice, with the new Sigma joining a crowded market of 35s. Sigma, as you know, may have three native 35s, but Sony itself has four, with the two most recent models delivering excellent performance. In my test, the more expensive Sony 35 1.4 G Master may have been similar in rendering style and actually a little worse in terms of focus breathing, but it delivers visibly crisper and more contrasty results at f1.4, plus its focusing on the Alpha 1 was much more consistent while also supporting the fastest burst speeds in continuous autofocus. The G Master is simply the better lens, and Sony's really spoiled us here, but it's also $500 more expensive. 
Now Sigma can match its optical quality, but using the similarly priced 35 1.2, and in my test that lens did not focus as reliably as the Sony models. Interestingly, it's the Sony 35 1.8G which arguably gives the new Sigma 1.4 the greatest competition, with crisp results wide open, more consistent autofocus, virtually no focus breathing, and similar potential for bokeh balls thanks to its slightly closer focusing making up for its slightly dimmer aperture. At $699, it's a key rival to weigh up. As a pre-production sample, that's all I can say for now, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on your favourite 35 and what lens you'd like Sigma to give the mirrorless DGDN treatment to next. As I said at the start, the best way to help me make more of these reviews is simply to subscribe, and if I've helped you in any way to make a decision or perhaps saved you some money, you can always tip me a coffee or treat yourself to a copy of my in-camera photography book. There's links to everything below, including the latest pricing on the lenses. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.